where we have a proton entering a uniform magnetic field at an angle of 90 degrees to that magnetic field. So we have the charge. Originally, the charge is here. It has a velocity in this direction in an area where there is no magnetic field. And then it's going to enter into a magnetic field, which is constant. So it gets to this point, and its velocity is to the right. What happens to the charge at this point? What is going to happen? Captain. Sure, what's going to happen? So it's moving to the right in an area where there's no magnetic field, so it's clearly just going to move at a constant velocity until it gets to this point. When it enters the constant magnetic field, just describe what happens to the charge. Well, there's going to be a magnetic force. Which direction? So it's going to experience a magnetic force, which is up. Okay, what happens then? John? Um, it, um, it accelerates. Which direction? Uh, up. up. So the velocity is no longer going to be just to the right. It's going to accelerate it upward, which is going to change the direction of the velocity, which is going to change the direction of the magnetic force, right? And so the path that the charge goes through actually ends up being, in this particular case, a semicircle. In this particular case, it would actually go through a semicircle and then come up right up here. So what is a, an accurate description of what direction the magnetic force is in? Emily? In the in direction, because it's moving in a circle. So what we can do here is we can sum the forces in the in direction, which is equal to the magnetic force, which is equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration. So magnetic force, Q, V, B, sine, theta, equals mass times. Uh, we have a couple of choices for centripetal acceleration. Eric Stasel, give me both. What does VT stand for? Over R or? Did it help you remember what you made, what mistake you made? Yeah. Which one? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, you should, what, what did we forget? That's the tangential velocity squared. So if you look here, everyone brought velocity to the party. We cancel out velocity, we get Q times V times the sine of is the mass times the tangential velocity divided by radius. Bless you, we don't have, really have anything we're solving for at this point, we're just solving for stuff, it'll be fun. Uh, the angle here is the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field, which you should be able to see is 90 degrees, so we end up with Q times B is equal to mass times the tangential velocity divided by the radius. We might as well solve for the radius, the radius is equal to the mass of the object times the tangential velocity divided by Q times b. Basically, to point out, we have a relationship here. Right? We can solve for any one of those items. It doesn't really matter in this particular case what we're solving for. Let's extend it a little bit farther. We know we can talk about the, because this is moving in a circle, we can talk about the angular velocity of it. What is the equation for angular velocity, Vlad? Well, it's it is equal to V over, I'm talking a more general equation for tangent, uh, angular velocity. You're relating it to tangential velocity, I'm talking about the definition of angular velocity. L over I? Say again? Is it L over I? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, no, that would be in terms of the angular momentum. Just talking a very general, Hillary. Um, that would say that over Just the change in the angular position over change in time. Yes, there are a whole bunch of other ones, but I was just talking all the way back to the most basic.
So if we talk about this, we know if change in theta is 2 pi class, the change in time is? The capital T or the period. So we can solve for the period. The period would be equal to 2 pi divided by the angular velocity. Uh, let's see, let's combine these things. Uh, let's solve for the tangential velocity is equal to uh, R times Q times B divided by the mass. Uh, we know the tangential velocity is equal to R times the angular velocity, so we can multiply both sides by R. We get R squared times Q times B divided by M. Uh, we could solve for the angular velocity. The angular velocity is equal to, why would I do that? Oh, we just get rid of, sure, we'll do that. No, there's no other R here. Why did I do that? What did I do? Tangential velocity is Right. Uh, tangential velocity is just R times omega, so we're just solving for omega. Yeah, that's, I don't know why I put a square on that. That's weird. Um, so, again, here, I'll do it for you. Everyone brought is. R, no R. Okay, so we get that the angular velocity is equal to Q times B divided by the mass. Uh, we can substitute in here, we get 2 pi times, uh, let's see, mass divided by Q times B. Okay. We have here the period. We also have here the angular velocity. Now, this specifically is called the angular frequency it is also sometimes called the cyclotron frequency. I know, which sounds so much better. So much better. I, I'm aware of that. But uh, the cyclotron frequency, the angular frequency, is also a term for it. So basically, my point here was there are all sorts of things we can solve for. We can solve for the time it takes for this charge to go through one full circle. In this particular case, we can figure out the time it takes until it's going to get ejected from the magnetic field. That would just be half the period. We can figure out the angular velocity, which is moving throughout this whole thing. We can figure out r, the radius, which would then figure out how far it's going to go vertically. It would just be 2 times r. There are all sorts of different things we could solve for in this particular case. Tim? Uh, if you want to use any of this question, Absolutely. <laughs> But it is. Look, that's relative. I mean, it's just combining all of these different equations. That's the, that's the joy of it. Okay. Uh, now, the point here is that these charges generally aren't going to go through this specific motion, right? A specific <laughs> circle. In general, they're going to go through some sort of helical path. Now, we don't really get to the helical path. It's just mathematically gets relatively complicated. Um, there is one problem that I did at one point. I don't know if we'll come back. It's kind of fun. But anyway, um, and this is really applicable to what happens around our own planet. Uh, we have this magnetic field. Our planet is constantly being bombarded by cosmic rays. There is solar wind coming from the sun in the form of protons and electrons, which are running into the planet. In the absence of our magnetic field, we would probably be much like Mars, in that we would not have an atmosphere, and we would all not be here. So, because we have a magnetic field, we're very lucky. We have an atmosphere, so we're alive. So you can thank your magnetic field for that. Now, this also causes kind of a fun effect near the poles, which is what? Aurora Borealis or Aurora Australis, depending on which pole you're talking about. Um, and what happens there is you get charges caught in the magnetic field of the planet, and they're moving very quickly, and they end up running into one another and give off uh, energy in the form of light during those collisions. Good. Oh, I just want to highlight, coming back to... When I use the term angular frequency, students, yes? Yeah? Matt has an awesome joke that relates right now. No, we're not going to do that. No. <laughs> now, when I get to angular frequency, cyclotron frequency, people tend to see the word frequency and stick with that. Please let me point out that uh, period is equal to 1 over the frequency. True? 
So this equation right here is equal to 2 pi times the frequency. So class is the angular frequency also equal to the frequency? Please make sure you understand that because often confused, people confuse the angular frequency with the frequency. The angular frequency is actually 2 pi times the normal frequency. Please be careful of that. 